to Authentic Living with Roxanne on Global Voice Radio. Join Roxanne Durhage and her thought-provoking conversation, the catalyst to live your life to the fullest. tell you a little bit about Lisa and um, welcome Lisa. Well thank you very much Roxanne. Such an honor and a privilege to not only be invited here on your show so this is a nice turn of the tables here. Nice treat for me Um, but because I did really love our synergy and I love your energy and I love empowered women um, you know I could talk about the stuff we love to talk about at nauseum. So thank you. So I'm going to do a bit with your bio and you know I often say I say a bit about your bio but I want you to fill in you're the best one to kind of tell the audience what's what they should really know about you to get to know about you. Okay. Um, so you, Lisa, has been empowering business owners, individuals, and entrepreneurs to transform their lives and achieve their goals and turn their dreams into realities by walking and talking and approaching life with love and work with fearless gratitude, enthusiasm, and hope. Wow. I love that, right? Just, Thank just you. so hopeful. And uh, she has a, a suite of services, coaching, mentoring, and her top related podcast, which we want to talk a lot about today, an online TV show. She inspires people to do their best every single day, which I think we all struggle with, Lisa. Um, she's an example. And um, for everyone out there, she empowers and invigorates people that she speaks to. And I've been in her presence and I've experienced it. So definitely um, it's something we're going to enjoy today. She, pro- she proves that moving away from fear anxiety and overwhelm, even the newest online entrepreneurs can generate exciting momentum as they move closer to building a life and business they love. I like that. Thank so, you. So thanks again, like I said, and, and today, um, and I know you and I, when we had, uh, I was on your show, we just talked and we had fun. So I, fear is something that I often see daily when I, you know, speak or whether I see a client or I coach and it's something that I think it's real. What we know is that it's real, um, except there's real fear where I'm going to, you know, be really hurt and fear that really cripples us from taking those steps because, um, daily, most of us get fearful about things that are out of our realm. So I want you to talk because that's your brand, Living Fearlessly with Lisa. So I want you to talk a little bit about that and kind of what got you connected with that and then turn kind of how that translates out to what you do daily with all the things that you do out in the world. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about, not it's, it's my brand, but it's really how I choose to live my life. And, uh, You know, it's really the message that I impart. I use all my platforms, my global platforms, uh, smaller circles, speaking, reading, uh, blogging, any opportunity I have to impart my message of living fearlessly to the masses because people do become crippled by this. Um, You know, at different stages uh, of my life, I'm not going to deny that, yeah, there's been fear. There's been Uh, you know, how am I going to overcome this? Because, you know, especially as we get older, as you know, Roxanne, and from the the clients that you meet on a regular basis, you know, life throws us all kinds of unforeseen circumstances. And we're always faced with the choice, am I going to succumb to this? Am I going to succumb to victimology? Or am I going to learn whatever the lesson might be in this? And there's a lesson with everything in life, not just the great stuff, rah, 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 you know, kudos, accolades, accomplishments, goals being achieved. It's more so the true testament of of what you're made of uh, in terms of grit, gumption, uh, owning your own power, uh, because I'm here to uplift people to fear less and to live more. Um, 
it's really going, okay, I've got to figure some things out here. You know, I'm, I'm, none of us come out unscathed. You know, we're all afflicted by different things, much of which, again, as we get older, are things that are foreseeably out of our control, but are inevitable. You know, as we get older, our parents get older. Uh, you know, we know that people are getting diagnosed with cancer much younger. We know all kinds of things in terms of global warming. You know, the world has seen all kinds of catastrophes and tsunamis and hurricanes and floods. I mean, there's just, you know, and then, and then just what's happening in the political arena in the States. Um, you know, there's a lot of things, but it, it's our choice what we choose to tap into i don't you know i know enough about global affairs i know what's going on in the world um but that's not the stuff that my mind needs i mean i'm really consumed and obsessed with mindset and so anybody who i showcase on radio oftentimes i will say you know, particularly for them to be at the level of success in which they are. And of course, we all define success very differently, very uniquely, very individually. Uh, but successful people in general, they have a set of rituals, they have a set of mantras, they have a set of proclamations, uh, they have um, a regimen, a daily regimen that has become habit forming. That's similar if you parallel it to somebody who is an avid runner. If they don't run their 10 miles a day, they feel physically sick. Their equilibrium's off, their mood's off, their demeanor's off, everything's off. And so when you when you take fierce action in your own life, and again, for me, it's about self-discipline, you know, motivation on its own, you know, and I've listened to some really interesting people who talk very specifically about the subject of motivation. And there's always different schools of thought for anything that I, I choose to sponge up. And, you know, motivation on its own, nobody feels motivated to get out of bed. Nobody feels motivated to deal and, and face head on a tragedy. There's no motivation in breaking a bad habit that doesn't serve you. But if you want different results in your life, if you want to be around people who are going to equal to you operate at their highest vibrational level, people who perhaps whatever it is that you aspire to do or endeavor to do, you know, look at the people who have already done it and have done it successfully. These are the people who you need to align yourselves with. And when you get exceptionally clear within yourself, because I don't think anything birthed, I don't think anything can be birthed unless you are exceptionally clear. And the things that you fundamentally need to get clear on before you can accomplish goals, uh, before you can up your game or take your life to the next level and, and just like go off on that trajectory of boom, you know, I accomplished it. And it might not be like a, a two week goal. It may not even be a one year goal. It could be a five, I've had five year goals. I've had long term goals and I just envisioned it. You know, I'm very much about blueprinting and road mapping things and seeing it, seeing it like it's already there. It's already been accomplished. You just need in physical real time through doing the hard work, putting one foot in front of the other, taking massive action, honing your mindset, you will eventually catch up. You can't have self-discipline. You can't have fierce tenacity and fortitude and commitment uh, and great mentors, which I always encourage, you know, get good mentors, you know, be around the good people who are going to keep you on the straight and narrow, who are going to be plugged into your journey, uh, you know, rather than watching the news, listen to the inspirational YouTube videos, the Tony Robbins, the Oprah Winfrey's, uh, the Mel Browns, the Les Browns. I mean, there's, there's so many influential people out there who have all, if you look at their backstory, they didn't just become an overnight success. They didn't just become like, wow, like they radiate and permeate all this like uh, ooze, ooze out of their pores, this wonderful aura. Generally speaking, nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, anybody who has risen in the ranks, who's really honed it and become masterful with their own mindset, they've become very good at turning shit into gold. You know, they've gotten really good at not surrendering or succumbing to the victimology. They've looked at their life lesson and, and have known, even if you want to look at it from a statistical standpoint, I am not the only one who's endured this in my life, whether it be a byproduct of divorce, whether it be disease, whether it be death of a spouse, whether it be death of a child, um, whether it be a bankruptcy, a divorce, whatever the case may be, we've all been afflicted by things. So it's looking at that and going, okay. I'm going to use this 
to serve myself, to prop myself, to anchor myself. And I'm going to lift people along the way because I know I'm not the only one. So for me, it's about be your own hero, be your own shiro, be your own leader, and be your own best friend. And particularly when you're entrepreneurial, particularly if you're in my case, uh, and there's many of us out there who are, I'm a serial solopreneur slash single parent. So I've chosen to wear as many hats as what I do because I'm impassioned by many things. Uh, you know, podcasting, radio being one of them. Uh, interfacing with lovely people like you who, you know, emit so much fantastic energy. So it's this reciprocal dynamic that, you know, you're feeding my soul, I'm feeding your soul. We're talking about the things that in both of our lives truly matter, which is going to elevate our own game, which is going to make you go back to your clients and perhaps offer a nugget that I've said and vice versa that lends a different perspective. Uh, oftentimes people in our industry, as you know, Roxanne, we say a lot of the similar things. We say a lot of similar things because we're aligned with each other. We believe the same things philosophically. We're aspiring to that level of, of personal best all the time and knowing it's not about being in competition with other people. It's about being the best, most improved version of ourselves each and every day. And so oftentimes radio guests who have plugged into my show, the feedback, the lovely feedback and the testimonials I've received is, you know, you and your particular guest on your show today, I've heard that said so many different times, but it was the way in which it was expressed. It was the parallels of the example that was illustrated by your guest. Something went on today, something clicked and it resonated with me. And it didn't matter how many times beforehand I'd heard something said quite similar. So thank you for that. So you just, you know, it's life altering stuff. We're, we're, we're shifting people because we've chosen to shift ourselves. And it does. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, what happens is, so, you know, I want your, I want your kind of take on this. A lot of people see, you know, see you or they see me and they think, oh, you know, these women have been successful. Um, you know, what do you know? about not getting out of bed or what do you know about not taking care of your kids right sometimes you know you hear people say that so mm -hmm. tell me about some of the rituals that you do daily to mm -hmm. kind of you know and I mean you've obviously been doing it for a long time and so have I mm -hmm. but of course we've both been through things I know you've been through stuff and I know in my book I, I share openly about what I've been through tell me what kind of rituals you do and when you start it right back. right, right. Well, I think my journey of self-discipline, uh, and I've, I've cited this before, long story short, I used to be a competitive swimmer. So I had a really vigorous, rigorous regimen that uh, spanned many years. It was, uh, you know, training was six days a week, twice a day, and I was in an individual sport. So it was me and the pace clock. It was me trying to shave uh, time off my time to obtain my best times. It was me trying to improve upon my personal stroke. It was me trying to get up in the ranks so that I could qualify for higher levels of competition. Um, so, you know, when you're getting up as a young kid before school starts and you're, you're training on weekends, you're training after school, before school, which of course you have a very uh, fierce workout regimen, uh, not just in the pool, but in preparation for being in the pool, diet, exercise, everything. Uh, you know, so I, I knew what it was because of what my goal was to make the choice to elect not to be the social kid. I did not go to all the parties. I did not go to all the playdates. I did not go to all these things. But I knew that in order for me to stay focused on what was pivotally most profoundly important for me at that juncture in my life, of course, you have to sacrifice things. And I, I was quite willing to forgo the other things to stay true to my passion of swimming. And um, so the discipline I've learned from that, and of course, my coaches were top tier coaches. So they were mentors, I was introduced to mentorship at a very young age, um, because of certain things that I had grappled with in my life. 
circumstances that had happened in my life. I mean, let's face it, I'm a divorced woman. I'm a single parent. I'm an incest survivor. I've been on my own since 16. I've paid my own way cash through college university, which came from working, choosing to work two to three day, uh, jobs at the same time to pay for my own tuition, to pay for my own books, to pay for my own transportation and everything else that goes with, you know, basic needs being met uh, while doing a placement and working in the field before I even officially graduated. Um, so I, I always knew what it was to hold uh, the role and the title and the responsibility of many things and learning how to juggle. So I wound up in social services, no coincidences, because of some of the things that uh, transpired in my life. And rather than feeling sorry for myself, rather than thinking, okay, this could have only have happened to me, uh, and being on my own at 16 years old, and yes, I'd gone off the rails at one point because I didn't have guidance, I didn't have therapy, I didn't have anything. There was nobody guiding me through this. Um, so as a result of doing a co-op placement that led to realizing that in the post-secondary world, uh, in the vocation world, wow, you know, I don't have to commit to something that's science-based. I don't have to commit to something that's math-based. I got into social services as a result of doing a placement in the CNIB, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind in the Social Work Department. And then I started applying for programs outside of that, and I got accepted into everything I applied to, and I did college first, and I did university second. Um, so again, the, the self-discipline I learned and adopted, and it became habit-forming as a competitive swimmer, got integrated into every aspect of my life going forward, especially knowing I had to be financially self-sufficient. I had to make sure that I got myself to classes, that tuition was paid every every semester it needed to be paid for. Um, and I couldn't use the excuse of, well, I'm so busy and I'm, I'm a student, I'm a full-time student. Well, I still got to commit to doing shifts. You know, I was work I was doing all kinds of shifts. I was doing overnight shifts. I was working with kids in group homes and foster homes at the time. And then once I actually got into the field, I scaled very quickly and became at the highest position I left prior to departing social services and, and choosing to become a stay at home uh, and then eventually single mom. Uh, was director of women's shelters, so women and children fleeing domestic violence. And that's when I lived out west, and I did have managerial experience here in Ontario. And as a result of my divorce, I brought my kids, who were then three and 18 months old, who were born in Alberta, transplanted myself back in Dundas, where I live. Uh, did it with minimal infrastructure, family support, but certainly had more than what I had out west. And um, and I, I was catapulted into single parenthood very quickly as a result of my ex-husband, um, who was also a careerist. He was an engineer. And in order to expedite us getting back here to Ontario, he took a job with the sister company of where he was working at West, which placed him on a three-year contract in Madagascar, Africa. Um, and it was six weeks out, 10 days back. So again, fortunately for me, having always been comfortable in my own skin and always feeling like I was a leader in my own life, um, I thought I can do this. You know, I've been on my own since 16. I've been paying my own bills. I've been making my own decisions with very little guidance outside of me later in life, seeking out specific mentors for myself and aligning with yummy people such as yourself, Roxanne. Um, but you know what? You just, you just, you got to do it. You just, you know, you, you just got to step into it. And I really believe, you know, regardless of religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs, and I'm very much a spiritual person, you know, I don't know what is on the other side. I have to be focused on the here and now and in the tangible sense of what I understand life to be and having attended enough funerals to know, okay, somebody's physical body is no longer here, regardless of what happens with their spirit. Um, I've got one crack at this and I, I do care about things like legacy. I've got a son and daughter. I want to leave things behind. So it's it, what I hear vitally important is, and, and I mean, You've been through trauma and what we know what trauma is, trauma is like the heavy blanket that, you know, weighs you down. So you have to do something different with it on a yes. continual basis. Because what we know with 60,000 thoughts a day, yes. and, you know, when people say to you, oh, I don't have a negative thought. I, I don't, I don't think they're telling you the truth. It's not <laughs> the truth. Yeah. It's what you do with it uh, often enough and rituals like, you know, so like don't, you know, oftentimes with some of my uh, clients, they would go get up and watch the news and, 
And then, of course, what's on the news? You know, it's everything horrible in the world. They're not talking about, you know, nice stories or, or, or flowers or things all over the world that are beautiful and precious. And then we wane and we wane and we wane. And then that further reinforces that concept. You see, the world's a bad place. And then when you get into that trajectory of here we go again, that's another validating factor and then before you know it, you maybe haven't gotten out of your pajamas and then you maybe haven't left the house or you maybe haven't brushed your hair kind of thing. And then it, it kind of fosters that whole poor me kind of syndrome. So I'm not saying that trauma survivors don't, they've been, they've been through horrible things. Mm -hmm. As we could see in the world, like you said, like yourself as a perfect example, myself being going, going through stuff as a child, um, you, know, you know, where I saw uncertainty, it's really about what you do with what you have at the end of the day, because you are not defined by your past. No, you no. are. All you have is right here, right now. And if you're repelled back to the past, which our brain does to protect us naturally mm -hmm. or repelled into the future, which is fear, then you're constantly in that state of angst versus just being present. And when you say that it becomes like a concept, but really that's what you're talking about. It's about, feeling your, you know, feeling your blood pumping, you know, talking to yourself better, being yeah. kind, being gentle and giving yourself that self-love that oftentimes maybe a lot of people didn't really receive, or maybe didn't receive the ideal kind of situation growing up, which takes a lot of repetition. Yes, right. absolutely. And, so, and I didn't really quite fully answer your initial question there. So in terms of what my rituals are, and this is what I impart and share with my mentoring clients as well, because if it works for me and they sought me out as a result of what they can see manifesting in my own life, uh, of course, I'm going to share that. It's important that we share the wealth. Um, so for me, three hours before I go to bed every night, I fall asleep to uh, inspirational uh, YouTube videos. So, you know, Les Brown, Tony Robbins, Oprah Winfrey, and I, I pick the ones that are at least a couple of hours long. And if it means I have to then pick another one, but three hours typically. So I fall asleep to this and this is what my DNA, my electrons soaks up. Um, because as you said, and you raised a very valid point, um, I am a very positive person. But yes, negative thoughts will filter through, but I recalibrate very quickly because I'm conscious enough to know that that's what's happening. And I don't give myself permission to stay stuck in that. I don't give myself permission to churn that over and let that define my day or my mood or my interaction or my exchange with somebody. I take massive responsibility for switching my thoughts and getting myself back on the path that serves me. So... I listen to, like I say, I, that's my ritual going to bed. I write my goals every day. And yes, some of them that are already been written out uh, that are like longer term plan goals. Uh, if, if I've done something incrementally along the way, that makes maybe originally a five year goal goal, still taking massive action on the long-term goals, and I'm making the phone calls, and I'm putting in the legwork, and I'm doing the research, then perhaps through my good habit, my habits, and my self-discipline, my five-year goal then becomes reduced to a three-and-a-half-year goal. But it doesn't mean that I'm negligent with the day-to-day -day goals, the weekly goals, the monthly goals, uh, because for people like you and I who are banging out content all the time, whether it be as bloggers, uh, knowing that we have to do prep work and be effective with our time to um, you know, meet the needs of what our clients who seek us out for and are entrusting their mindset and their heart, their soul, their spirit, their healing journey, uh, and they're paying for it. So, I mean, I, you know, the more my roster uh, goes up, the more people I have to do some background work on, yet still meet the deadlines for my blogging for Ariana Huffington, my weekly guest, and knowing that we're pretty savvy, my team and I, with the ramping up and the marketing of each guest. So we do it on the Monday, we do it on the Wednesday, we do it on the Friday, the morning before I technically go live, because I'm monetized now. So they're paying me money, good money, to ensure that our graphics are good, the consistency of when we're ramping them up, where we're ramping them up, cross-promoting is taking place. I'm still, although I've got two sponsors, right now I'm looking for a total of five sponsorship and ad sponsors takes a long time so I'm doing that as well behind the scenes I'm raising two children and doing as much as I can in between school hours waking hours um, so I have to be very committed to how I'm properly and effectively making every minute of every day count and then of course when they're with their dad every other weekend 
it's work. That's work. That's an entrepreneur. There's no nine to five. There's no clocking out, no complaining. I'd much rather be a slave to myself than someone else. Um, so, you know, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's served me well in terms of things like sick days, stat holidays, Christmas holidays, March break. Um, you know, I can't imagine for all the time that the kids have been off school, whether it be because of the stat holiday calendar or because of illness. You know, if I had ever returned to the level of management that I was at, I wouldn't have been able to be an effective leader because it would have been me calling in sick all the time to be the provider and the caregiver for my children. So, you know, you got to, and of course it was risky when I went through that reinvention process. Uh, you know, I, I embarked upon becoming an entrepreneur when my mom died, when my grandma died, when I was uh, legally separated, legally separated, then turning into a divorce. Uh, my ex-husband being in Madagascar, Africa. Um, yeah, so, you know, some people would go like, why are you such a glutton for punishment? Why, when you're already going through an exorbitant amount of stress and crisis, would you then decide to embark upon becoming an entrepreneur, knowing what that entails and what's required if you're going to pull that off and be successful at it? It's like, well, because I have to garner an income, I, you know? I, and I mean, the lawyers would have been quite fine had I gotten a part-time job pouring coffee at Tim Hortons just to say that I was contributing. Um, and no disrespect to anybody, we need everybody in every sector and in every industry to do what they do for everything to run bickety boo. Uh, but I, over the years, I've invested a lot of money into my personal development, my training, masterminds, workshops, mentors, coaches. Um, there was no way I wasn't going to take a look at a serious look at my transferable skills and go, okay, how can I work for myself, but meet the needs of my children and them, of course, being and always remaining the number one priority. So I just got clear. I got clear. I stepped into it. I took a risk and I have been going like stink ever since. So, and it's, it's so in interesting that a lot of times, and even my story at the time, I, I walked away um, also ending my marriage. Uh, I did the same thing. I, I didn't have a job. And, uh, you know, and I thought, well, this is, this is so not feeding my soul anymore that I have to, I have to clear my soul, first of all. And then my friend said to me, you know, maybe you kind of could have thought this out. Maybe you could have waited a little bit. And I said, there comes a point when the door goes down and you have to do something. And I, I'll remember clearly that day when I said, okay, I'm out. And, <laughs> and, you know, corporate consulting job, six figure income. I'm in this house alone thinking, okay, now what am I going to do? Right. And then like, you're right. It's kind of like, I've got to go through this dark tunnel and I'm hoping to God there's light on the other side, but I know what I'm coming for, from was, was not feeding my soul to be able to walk towards something different. And it's having that belief yes. that in yourself or like you said, in something bigger that I'm going to be okay because I've got it in there, even though I may not feel like it at that time because I'm in pain, I'm in dire straits. You know, I've got a young son. My son was eight, those types of things. And then what happens, you know, you, you connect, you connect, you have good friends, which is what resilience is about. And we know that from the research. It's about, do I sit in a ball and, and feel sorry for myself? Or do I just throw myself a little party once a year and get everybody together or as often as I need to, to connect, to chat, to have chocolate, to have wine, to talk mm -hmm. about you know, your children or you know those types of things. And then somewhere along there, you get through that time. Yes. Right. And it's about recognizing, like you said, it's, it's an incremental bit, a bit at a time. And okay, what can I do now? What can I do now? And then sometimes it doesn't have to be a big vision other than I just don't want to feel, you know, as cruddy as I'm feeling today. So there must be something different. So when you kind of look at your goals, because I think that's important, you know, a lot of people, you know, they, they plan goals and, you know, they, it's, it's kind of like, how do I get my vision? Like, you know, like you, like you, I, I have a legacy in the world. I want to ensure that everybody in this world recognizes that they are not where they came from. That's and pain true. does not define you. Mm -hmm. Pain is something that's there, but you can pass through it and really actualize who you need to be. That's, that's what I hope to do with every, you know, woman and child in the world, because I know women, you know, not that men don't, but they are the concentric circles of the family and also men, you know, to be able to help them. That's what I want. So that, and to, so my son sees that and he's a phenomenal young man in the world. When you plan your goals, right. Or when you planned your goals, 
how do you do that? Do you do like, uh, okay, in the next five years, I'm going to be, you know, the number one blogger in the world. Um, what, what, how do you define that? And then how do you break it down from five years or three years to one year to six months to, you know, every month to daily? Because I think that's a good thing for people to know as they kind of walk through goals, because, you know, everybody does the new year resolution thing and we know how far that gets. Yeah. About really following through. So I'm just curious about what you do. Well, I'll, to answer your question, I'll give, because people need to understand examples. People benefit from examples and storytelling. So two things that I can speak to with regards to that with long-term goals. So one, going back to what I said about, you know, my, my children and I, we transplanted back here in Ontario as a result of the separation going into divorce. That was 2011. Bought this house, uh, did the house hunting on my own, got the house, uh, about two weeks after I got the house, that's when their father moved to Madagascar. I knew that there wasn't going to, it was going to take, it was going to take about four or five years in total with him having been on contract and then knowing when the contract ended, he would then need to transplant himself back here. He would have to find a new place to live. He would need to find a new job. And that was going to take some time. So I was at that point already committed to, you know what? I don't know what the stability, because this is what we talked about. For five years, we had lawyer's appointments every time he came back from Madagascar. And, you know, so it was like, okay, what's going to happen in five years with the status of the home? Is Lisa going to be able to afford to do a buyout, right? In my mind... And this was before I even embarked upon becoming entrepreneurial. It was probably like six months to a year before I got to that point of embarking upon becoming entrepreneurial. But this was something that the lawyers had already said, we need to start, you need to start thinking about this, Lisa. So the expectation was, you know, once my youngest had started school full time, and of course, my kids already having been young at that point, and they were 18 months apart, I thought, you know what? I know five years goes exceptionally fast. You don't need to tell me that. People think they've got lots of time. They can sit on things. They can. I didn't have the luxury of going through what normal people would generally be entitled to as far as a grieving process or adapting to their new reality of being a true single parent uh, with very minimal infrastructure of support. I knew I had to get busy. I knew I had to get clear. I knew I had to figure this out very, very fast because I knew that five years was going to come up very quick. I said to myself, I said to him, and I said this in, in lawyers meetings, I said, I don't know what the plan is yet, but there will never be a for sale sign on that property. I will be buying you out. These kids are not going to go through transition again. This is the only home based on the age of this having happened that they have any recollection of. They didn't remember the home in Alberta. Because again, my son was three, my daughter was 18 months when we came to Ontario. And I said, I am not going through that. We've done a provincial move. They've had to say goodbye to their dad to go to Madagascar. Everything's changed. I said, we are not going through that again. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what it looks like. That is not happening. So I had already made that very definitive definitively clear, not only within myself, but I spoke that out as my reality. I spoke it out to the uh, other parties who needed to be privy to this discussion, who needed to know what my thought process was. And so, of course, within that five-year span of still being lawyered up and still having to come to resolution and the contract having come to an end, and then it very much getting to the point of, um, it was four years, I asked for another year because I was already entrepreneurial at that point. And I said, you know what, it's not unrealistic for a startup for somebody to need like two or three years to figure this out. At this point, it had been four. They wanted an answer at the four-year mark. I said, no, I've been, I, for all the sacrifices that I've made and the position that I've been in, and, as, you know, and I would never begrudge having been a stay-at-home mom uh, because I wouldn't want it any differently, but I was fundamentally always a careerist. So because I chose to give my children the best upbringing possible, also in murky circumstances of major transition and me not having a lot of support, there has to be some flexibility with that. There has to be some, uh, you know, there has to be some leeway with that because you've been climbing in your job in Madagascar making killer cash and I've been raising your children um, and we're amicable. So there's no facetiousness here, but it was like, no, I, 
I walked out of my job. I walked out of promotions. I've walked out of salaries. I've walked out of all kinds of things. And I said, and I've made a very good go at this. I know where this is going. You owe me one more year. You owe me one more year before I can do that buyout. And I'm sitting there going, how the hell am I going to do this? But I'm going to do it. And so that fifth year mark came, that date was on the calendar, one year in advance of having that discussion. And I'd met with my lawyer beforehand because she wanted to prep with me before we had that uh, group collaborative meeting. And I said, yeah, I can do this. And I was able to not only get my, you know, reclaim my home and it be my home and do the buyout, but I did it without a co-signer. And um, everybody was shocked. Everybody was shocked, including myself. But, but see, this is the power of language. This is the power of mindset. Uh, it was more, it freaked me out more to envision what my children would go through with showings, a for sale sign, you know, still having to move, even if it was locally, but it was to something cheaper. You still got to move house. You still got to, you know, you got to keep the kids busy while you got real estate agents coming through, showing people their home. My kids wouldn't have understood it. It would have been a disaster. And so that thought made it non-negotiable for me. It's like, that cannot happen at any cost. I need to make sure that my kids never see that situation come to the light of day. And so it made me work harder. It made me get more exceptionally clear. And I think as moms, you know, like that mama bear, that, that whatever, I mean, there is nothing to me that's more intrinsically, more maternally that just takes over. You know, you hear about women lifting cars off their children or, you know, all these kinds of weird situations when they're, they're, you're faced with a crisis. Well, that was my crisis. I couldn't imagine my kids going through that emotionally. Um, and if it was just me, I wouldn't care. Let go of the house. But this was their home. We laid down some roots. We got a school around the corner. I built up an infrastructure of support. I was not going to put myself through the, the kids' unnecessary upheaval. So that was a five-year plan. I didn't know where I was going at the beginning of that, but it was just, it was non-negotiable. So when I saw, when I envisioned that five-year goal of no for sale sign, and I played it over and over, sitting in that lawyer's meeting, <clears throat> I can do the bio. I play that over and over. Not, oh my God, how am I going to make this work? And, you know, no, it was like, no. When I did my mind work, when I got very exceptionally clear, it was everything that I played over in my mind, it was the end result of what I was aspiring to achieve. It was being able to look the lawyers in the face and my ex-husband and say, yeah, I did this and I did it on my own. And that's what I focused on. That's what I focus so that, on. You had a pinpointed vision yes. at the end of the day. And I think that's the important thing. And I, oftentimes people set goals and they don't hook it to what's, emo, what's important to them. Yes. And that's the pebble in the rough here that I'm pulling out. Because oftentimes people will say, you know, I want this massive career, but they don't realize they're going to be in a train or plane an automobile away from the people they love, the people, the reason they're doing it. So yeah, I think yeah. betting goals like you did and being so pointed yeah. becomes a vision. And then from there, what you're saying that everything kind of, things started to kind of morph out of that. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yes. So example number two, and I'll be very quick about this. So example number two. So I've been doing radio podcasting for three years, celebrated my three-year anniversary yesterday. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that. And so I knew that this had to become part of my business model. And I knew I was relatively new. I, was, I wasn't new to being in the media because, of course, this, I was always the spokesperson for the agency that I represented or the client demographic that I represented. So, you know, when it was Women's Day or if it was something on the calendar and it was a news event, local news, I was always in the paper. I was always taking the mic and stuff like that. So, again, these are transferable skills. I've always been very comfortable with public speaking. I've always been comfortable talking about things, again, that I am impassioned by, particularly when it comes from a pay it forward, be of service, you know, help the collective, help the masses. Um, so when I got sought out for radio three years ago by the Contact Talk Radio Network, Cameron Steele, the network owner, and I'm now with two global networks, C-Suite uh, Radio Network in New York, and Jeffrey Hazlett, he is the co-founder CEO of that. So double platform. But I knew I knew even when it came to, okay, you know, this is a weekly gig. I need to find guests. You know, there's a lot of work that's involved in that. Uh, I need to build up a social media footprint that 
for anybody who big I'm going after, they're going to do their homework and go, okay, who's this girl? And you know, what kind of followership does she have uh, behind her? How serious is she? So, you know, I took a look at who I wanted my guest roster to consist of. And I've, 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 I've interviewed people who have notable house hold names and people who don't, but they're all equally stellar in their own right and bring something to my loyal listeners and my podcast subscribers. And so I thought, okay, well, who would I want to be on my show? You know, this is all about consciousness in action. This is all about personal empowerment. You know, who are the people that have resonated with me in my journey? Who have I sponged up in the personal development world for decades of belonging to it long before it became buzzword or trendy or cool or whatever? Uh, When you're in social services, you're very much immersed in the personal development world. And so I thought, okay, you know, Deepak Chopra, I resonated with him. Got Deepak Chopra. Took me a year. I only got a 20 minute interview out of my 55 minute time slot, but I got Deepak Chopra, went after Lisa Gibbons, uh, David Suzuki, like all kinds of people in their, in different realms of, of what they're good at and would be considered like a, a top tier expert or thought leader. Uh, I went after these people and it's consistently, I'm doing it one right after another, um, which has increased my stats, my visibility, my podcast subscribers. I'm now sitting at over half a million podcast subscribers, which I'm very grateful for. And um, I'm oversubscribed now, and I'm looking to expand my show to twice a week. But again, when I started out, I was no one. And I didn't know who was going to take me seriously. And I didn't know who was going to say yes in terms of the top tier guests being sought, I sought out to appear as a guest on my radio show. And then, you know, once you get the first one, then it's easier to sell for the second time for the big person, the big person. You keep going, you keep going. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to take this to the level where I can be one of those very few podcasters in this world because we're an oversubscribed, oversaturated industry. And people say all the time, I mean, Howard Stern has said it on his podcast, you know, it's virtually impossible to monetize. But again, I don't take those limitations. I mean, the only person who's going to place limits on me is me. And I'm not going to place limits on myself. I don't even say sky's the limit. I say beyond the sky is the limit. I'm not holding myself back. I don't allow other people to hold myself back. And I'm very good at tuning out the naysayers, the critics, the whatever. I am so laser focused on what I'm doing. So for the for two and a half years, people would get showcased for free. The last six months, last year or so, I have turned it into now it's pay to play. Because people need to start, and this is how I explain it. To piece. Some people go, some pe- most people get it. They understand the rate of investment. They understand the rate of return. They understand that they want to take their product, their voice, their message, their brand, their book, their whatever. And the whole point of media is to garner the largest possible audience that you can. You want to get more impact. You want to get more people following you. You want to increase your bottom line. And so I say to people, look, I'm connected with two global networks now. Combined listenership hovers anywhere between four to eight million. We're heard in 145 countries, 220 TV, radio, terrestrial satellites, and the potential for millions of iTunes downloads. We do, my my team, we do graphics. We embed the, the pictures that you would want showcased. We do it three days a week. We do it all over my social media, every social media platform I have. If we're attached somehow, I tag you, cross promote you. I have like over 100,000 people between my social media sites. So just from out of the gate before we even go live, you know, they're getting major, major promotion. And the more people find out who I'm interviewing, and it's a guest that perhaps resonates with them, and then they listen to either the live show or the podcast, then it's like, okay, I want to tune into this is great content. I want to tune into this more consistently. And, um, So, yeah, so people understand this is a business model now. And, you know, it's, it's, it's no different than going to a gas station. You don't go to a gas station, fill up your vehicle and and not expect to pay. You don't go to the grocery store, fill up your cart and wave to the cashier. See you later. I am providing a service. that, That would be a bit critical. So really it's about being pointed. Yeah. And following it. You may not know where you're going to end up, but you have a vision yeah. That you wanted to make a difference in your children. You wanted your children to be safe and secure. Yes. And you wanted to create a legacy. And out of that came all these amazing things. 
It was but, a, lot but, of, yeah. a lot of hard work though. A lot of hard work, but it also goes down to the core fundamental ingredient, which anybody who I've showcased, anybody I've interviewed, anyone who's my mentor, even yourself, Roxanne, you know this. You have to fundamentally believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, no one else is going to believe or buy into you. Absolutely. You've, got, you've got to be your number one fan. And people think, oh, my God, that's so narcissistic. That's so egoic. It's No, it's not. It's self-love. You know, why would I love you more than I love myself? Why would I see myself as a secondary class citizen? Why do I think you deserve happiness and abundance and I don't? Why would I raw, raw you and go, good on you, Roxanne. I mean, boom, you've done this. Boom, you've done that. And then when I look at my own accomplishments and poo-poo it, oh, it's not a big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal because I know the blood, sweat, and tears that have gone into making that happen. And for people who think from a marketing perspective or an optics perspective or a social media perspective that everything that I ramp up, like, oh, I've interfaced with this person or this is who I'm showcasing or, you know, I've just put out my fourth children's book or I've got a book signing or I've got, I spoke at Harvard a year and a half ago, whatever the case may be, people think, oh my God, like this person's just so lucky. There's absolutely nothing to do. It's nothing to do with luck. You know, I could tell you all the rejections I get as compared to the bullseye. I can tell you about all the things that have gone awry or fallen apart as compared to the things that seemingly look effortless and like, wow, like this just keeps materializing for her, you know, but I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take my, my failures and my flops to social media. I don't mind talking about it from a vulnerability standpoint and authentic standpoint in an interview like this, but social media, it's a visionary board for me. I use social media. I put it out there as an accountability piece. It's not enough just for me to write my sticky notes and my, my goal sheets and my journaling and my self proclamations and my rituals. I want the people who I'm expecting and graciously requesting and hoping buy in to me, whether it be tuning into my podcast or buying my books or attending my speaking engagement or wanting to collaborate or partner with me in some capacity. I want people twofold. I want people to see, yes, I don't just hold myself accountable publicly because I'm a public figure, as are you. I am holding, I'm allowing you to hold me accountable. So if I'm falling short, take me to task. I mean, likely I'm not going to put myself in a position of humiliation like that. And if something doesn't uh, occur in the way I've been led to believe, because third party people will disappoint you and drop the ball, not necessarily because I did, and I don't out people and I don't, you know, defame people or humiliate people. Um, but I put it out there. It's a 3D visionary board. Secondly, as a result of saying I'm holding on to my house on Facebook, as a result of saying I'm going to be an entrepreneur, even though my mom and my grandma just died and, and my ex is in Madagascar and I'm a single parent to two young kids, you know, the amount of people through seeing my momentum and growth, more importantly, who have reached out to me, whether it's turned into a mentoring, uh, coaching client relationship, or it's just turned into a testimonial or feedback or whatever the case may be, privately and publicly. Lisa, as a result of you having the balls to do that, I looked at what everything I know your backstory to be. And I, I said, I can't sit on the couch anymore. I can't feel sorry for myself. Look at what she's doing. And she's just this average woman from Dundas, Ontario, Canada. She, She's amassed what she's amassed out of nothing because she saw it and she went for it and she didn't let anyone get in her way, more so myself. I didn't get my own way. I got very comfortable with being uncomfortable. These people have seen how possible this is because I've chosen to hold myself accountable on social media. They are now, they're shifting in their life. They're, they're walking into living fearlessly completely on their own now uh, as a result of seeing me as a living, breathing example of somebody who has walked the talk. So you're when the, I, you're the role model. Yes. You have to live up to that role. You elevate that yourself to that. And obviously I can see, you know, your passion because on the other end, it was, it was, um, you know, you interviewing me. So I didn't see this, but I love it. I love <laughs> the passion and the enthusiasm and the fact that you want to make a difference in the world, which is really what I want to do too. Right. Like you I are, you are. Own uh, it. Yes, yes, for sure, for sure. So I, you know, you've really helped 
me understand your path. And I, I know my listeners have gotten a phenomenal message out of this. If there's, I want to make sure that whoever wants to reach out to you, wants to buy your book or what, where do they find you? I appreciate that. So the best uh, place to connect with me because all my suite of services are there. My contact information is there, you know, all the different, um, apps to connect with on Facebook. Everything is on my website. It's my newly branded website, livingfearlesslywithlisa.com. So livingfearlesslywithlisa.com. And there's different sections for whatever it is that you're interested in connecting with me. There's a section for speaking. There's a section for radio, uh, wanting to become a guest, where to buy my books, et cetera, et cetera, or just to have a conversation. So if there's anything I can do to help you help yourself, I'm here to empower you to help yourself, to empower yourself. Uh, And again, it's all through uplifting you to fear less and to live more. So if you feel there's a connection, if you see that there's a way in which I can help you, there's also uh, for mentoring and coaching too. There's a whole host of different um, ways people can connect with me, but it's all at my website, livingfearlesslywithlisa.com, livingfearlesslywithlisa.com. Not to mention for anyone who's connected with you on social media, they just have to go in your search bar and put in Lisa McDonald because we're connected. Awesome. LinkedIn. LinkedIn is my favorite site because it truly is professional. People are really there. They're there to convert. They're there to do business. It's, it's real deal. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So all I can say is um, my show is about authenticity and I don't, I think you might be the most authentic, if not one of the most authentic guests I've had to date. So oh, thank, thank you. you so much. I just got goosebumps. Thank you. And uh, I, I want anybody else that wants to hear more um, about my uh, living authentically with Roxanne, you can go to roxannedurhodge.com forward slash sex, and that will give you a, a, a video series on high intimacy and sex and relationships so that you can make things better um, with uh, two videos that will come your way. Thanks again for uh, tuning in, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Roxanne. That was beautiful. I appreciate it. Thanks again, Lisa. We'll talk soon. Fantastic. You have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye. Eastern on Global Voice Radio.